My name is Bassem Awad. I'm the Deputy Director for Intellectual Property and Innovation at the International Research Program here at CG. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today for what promised to be an exciting and enlightening presentation by our friend and colleague, Ms. Bridget Vezina. Before I introduce uh, Bridget and her topic, I would like to first acknowledge on behalf of CG that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee uh, peoples. CG is situated on the, on the uh, Haldimand tract, the land promised for, uh, to the six nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. Today, Brigitte will focus on the cultural appropriation in the fashion industry. Since she published her paper with CG uh, two months ago, I was following her on Twitter, and by coincidence, I don't know if either it's by coincidence or the media were following her, we have seen a lot of examples of misappropriation within the world of fashion, from the big fashion designers to the small uh, companies. We have seen several examples of misappropriation. Brigitte today will cover the uh, relation or the role of intellectual property rights, in particular copyright in the protection of traditional cultural expression of indigenous people, and whether IP rules are sufficient or we need additional tools. Our speaker is an international IP law consultant at her law firm, uh, law and culture firm, she is a fellow with the International Law Research Program here at CG, where she focused on the international negotiation for the IP protection of traditional cultural expression and examining IP issues around cultural, cultural appropriation. Prior to joining CG, Brigitte worked for the World Intellectual Property Organization at the TK Division for 10 years. Before that, she used to work for the uh, UNESCO uh, and in Paris and the Montreal-based IP law firm Rubik. With no further ado, I, I am delighted to welcome Brigitte Vezina to the podium for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Basim, for these nice words of introduction. And thank you very much to CG for welcoming me. And thank you all for joining me on this presentation and to allow me to present some of my thoughts on um, cultural appropriation, fashion, and if copyright has anything to do to alleviate the situation. But let's get to the heart of the matter with a case, the case of Isabelle Marin and uh, Wipil. And a whipil is a piece of clothing that you can see appear on the screen, traditionally from the Mixe people of Mexico. So Isabelle Marin, she's quite famous in the fashion circles. She's a, a Paris-based designer who's known for her bohemian chic style. And in 2015, she marketed a dress called the Viola dress. And what was special about this Viola dress was that it bared striking resemblance to the Wipil of the Mixe people of Santa Maria Tlahuitl-Tepec in Oaxaca, Mexico. And by striking, I mean it was identical. And so that was brought to the attention of the Mixe community, who contacted uh, Isabel Marin and accused her of copying their centuries-old design that was for them a symbol of their identity. And in the face of such accusations, which actually went all over social media, there were lots of Twitter posts about this, and even protests outside of the Isabel Marin store in New York, Isabel Marin contended that she had simply derived inspiration from the Mixe Whippel. She had not plagiarized, as was the term used, and she didn't claim to be the author of any of these designs. So in the end, the Mixe people decided not to bring any charges. Um, for the main reason that they didn't really have any legal standing to do so, unfortunately. But Isabel Marin did get sued for copyright infringement. 
by a different fashion label based in Paris called Antique Batik, who did claim copyright in similar embroidery designs. So we are faced with a situation where we have two fashion companies in France that both claim to be the authors of some design. One even claims copyright protection over these designs. And the mixed community who has at, is at the origin of these designs is completely left out of the discussion. So the case was brought to court, and the court in Paris decided that neither Antique Batik or Isabelle Marant could own copyright in these designs, which uh, originated in the Mixé community. So that the, left the Mixé community a little bit hanging. So about a year later, the Congress of the province of Oaxaca in Mexico issued a de declaration uh, stating that the Wipil and other forms of expressions of the Mixé community were what is called intangible cultural heritage under the 2003 UNESCO Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. However, that does not amount to intellectual property protection and does not give a legal basis to sue anyone for copying or for imitating or for borrowing any form of design. But it may be considered as a source of justice in this whole case because at least it recognizes that this typical weepil embroidery originates in and is unique to the Mixé people. And if you go on the Wikipedia, um, as I did before um, preparing for this presentation, and look up Isabelle Marin, the French version page, you will read something along the lines that the blouse of Tlautl-Tepec is in the public domain, such that anyone can freely draw inspiration. Now, this is the, the belief that is uh, held in relation to this blouse. So, we might say, well, it's true. The case decided that no one could own copyright because it originated in the Mixé community. But did that, does that necessarily mean that it's in the public domain? Maybe that's debatable. And even if we do consider that it's not protected by copyright or even by any form of intellectual property, and it is from an intellectual property standpoint in the public domain, does that mean necessarily that anyone can freely draw inspiration well, it's this kind of issues that we'll be discussing through this presentation. And I think this case nicely summarizes all the different issues that can arise, and we can see that it's not always so straightforward. So before I go on, I'd get, like to give you a brief outline of the talk so that we can all follow where this is going. Um, I'll first address main issues, give, situate uh, the discussions, and see how they are um, panning out in them in the international scene. I'll also give you some basic concepts so that we're all on the same page and there's no misunderstandings about what we're talking about. Then I'll look at the causes of cultural appropriation, see what might explain their prevalence, and also the effect that cultural appropriation has on the holders of traditional cultural expressions. And then I'll look at what can be done to curb cultural appropriation. So first on a level of principles or on the level of ideas, and then on a more practical level to see what concrete solutions we can bring. So starting with the issues and concepts. If I had to summarize this whole discussion onto one slide, I would say that fashion designers, they draw inspiration from all corners of the world, and they've done so for centuries. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, by the way on the contrary. But sometimes, so sourcing elements from traditional cultures and reusing them out of context can cause harm. And this is what translates as cultural appropriation. On the left side of the screen, you can see a traditional mola design from the Kuna people of Panama. And I don't know if you're aware, but just a couple of yeah, weeks ago, not even two weeks ago, um, Nike, the sportswear manufacturer, wanted to launch a special sneaker that was especially designed uh, to celebrate Puerto Rico, and it was called the uh, Nike Air Force One Puerto Rico, and it had a design on the side of the shoe which very much looked like this Mola pattern. So not only did they not ask anyone about using this kind of pattern, but they reference Puerto Rico, where it actually comes from Panama, from the Kuna people of Panama. And uh, because 
the Kuna people were quick to spot it and to react. Uh, Nike immediately canceled the launch of this special edition sneaker. So in a sense, that case was settled quickly, um, but it's not the case for all cases of cultural appropriation. Sometimes they drag on and on. As the case of Isabel Marron, it took her months before she acknowledged that there had been something harmful and uh, that she decided to pull the dress from sale. So if I were to sketch the debate into um, a balance uh, drawing like this, a balance drawing, I would say that on the one side of the debate, there's of course support for a dynamic fashion industry an industry where a diversity of cultural influences is what makes fashion evolve and thrive. There's also within the fashion industry a very common practice of copying or of borrowing, whether it is from designers themselves or from outside, outside uh, traditional cultural expressions, but also uh, contemporary art or uh, all sorts of, uh, of artistic uh, creative inspiration sources. And there's also more recently um, a kind of trend to try to um, celebrate traditions through a modern lens. So designers wanting to use traditional folkloric types of clothing and giving them a modern spin. And that has been very popular in fashion, I'd say, since the beginning of uh, the 1990s. But on the other side of the debate, there are calls for better respect for the rights of indigenous rights and interests. Because as I've mentioned, sometimes using these cultural elements in fashion can be extremely harmful. And we'll look at to the different types of harm that can occur, but it's usually done because cultures are being misrepresented in fashion by external designers. So I'm thinking, well, one way to make sure that uh, there is no such misrepresentation anymore would be to give the holders of their traditional cultures better control over the way that their cultures are being represented in fashion. And one way to achieve that better control might be through intellectual property rights and especially copyright. And this um, inscribes itself in the context of international rights and especially rights, intellectual property rights of indigenous peoples. In 2007, the United Nations adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and Canada has ratified it and is in the process of implementing it. And it guarantees uh, in Article 31 uh, that indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. And I would add, because the article continues to say, and the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their intellectual property over such cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. So this is enshrined at the international level in a declaration that um, recognizes the rights of indigenous peoples. And within the United Nations family, the agency uh, dealing with these issues is the World Intellectual Property Organization based in Geneva. And at WIPO, as we call it, uh, the Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property, Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge, and Folklore, and you'll notice folklore is a synonym, a synonym for traditional cultural expressions has the mandate, um, and these are just excerpts, has the objective of reaching an agreement on an international legal instrument relating to intellectual property, which will ensure the balanced and effective protection of traditional cultural expressions. And we can see in the negotiations that are currently going on, so the IGC, so the Intergovernmental Committee, was uh, established in 2000 and has been holding uh, text-based negotiations since 2011. And we can see um, that within the IGC, uh, uh, an international framework is emerging for the protection of traditional cultural expressions based in an in intellectual property instrument. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So I've been talking about traditional cultural expressions, but I haven't given you a proper definition yet. Um, there's no agreed definition. Uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization works with uh, uh, evolving working 
concept. But they are, for example, um, designs, patterns, signs, symbols, artworks, artifacts, rituals, songs, stories, dances, names, etc. So a lot of uh, the examples, as I mentioned, could fall in the category of copyright works, or sometimes they also look a lot like uh, signs or symbols that could be protected under trademark law. However, they have certain characteristics that prevent them from receiving full protection from copyright or trademark law, as we will see later. So they are the intangible, or, uh, sorry, the tangible or intangible forms in which traditional cultures are expressed or embodied. They are passed down from generation to generation and often in an oral context, there's often no written transmission. They are linked to an indigenous people or a local community. And they are often the creations of authors unknown. Now, as to cultural appropriation, I also want to dispel any misunderstandings because the term has gotten a lot of media attention but has come to mean everything and anything. And I think it's really important that we all agree on a very precise definition of cultural appropriation so that when we enter into discussions about this issue, we are all on the same page. And although there is no agreed definition, uh, in the course of my research, I was able to come up um, with a, a summary of what I think could uh, describe cultural appropriation. So in short, it is the act by a member of a dominant culture of taking a traditional cultural expression whose holders belong to a minority culture and repurposing it in a different context without authorization, acknowledgement, and or compensation. And I would also add, also cause causing harm. So from the definition I've just read to you, we can see that there are three characteristics emerging. The first is a change of context. Um, you may have heard about a lot of festival uh, attendees going uh, to Coachella or other music festivals donning a feathered headdress. So there's a big difference within, uh, between wearing a feathered headdress at a sacred ritual and wearing it as just a simple fashion accessory at a festival. And the fact that the feathered headdress is just used as a fashion accessory really strips it of its spiritual meaning. And so that change of context is what actually takes all the meaning that is imbued in the sacred object and completely takes it out. And that really can cause harm. The second characteristic is that there's often a power imbalance between the community that takes and the community that is being taken. And that often arises in the context of colonization where there's already been patterns of exploitation of another culture. And the third characteristic is the absence of the holder's involvement. So the holders of the traditional cultures are not attributed. So in the case of Isabel Marron and her viola dress, she never mentioned that it had been inspired even by the Mixi community. Um, and there are myriad other examples where they're just taken and not giving any credit back. There's also um, no authorization ever sought, so it's just taken without asking. And there's often no compensation. So even though the Isabel Marin dress um, was for sale for the equivalent of around 4,500 Mexican pesos, the original Huipil would sell for 300 pesos in Santa Maria Tehuitlantepec. So that's 15 times the price. And the Mixi community has absolutely no share in any benefit that Isabel Marin could make by selling her dress. Now, I've mentioned cultural appropriation, but like I said, it's not a term that has a, an accepted legal definition, at least to my knowledge. And the World Intellectual Property Organization um, uses the terms rather misuse or misappropriation or even unlawful use in the draft articles on traditional cultural expressions. <coughs> but I do believe that a lot of the issues that arise in the debate on cultural appropriation could find uh, a good forum to be addressed within the World Intellectual Property Organization because cultural appropriation certainly overlaps with what the WIPO might understand under misuse, misappropriation, or unlawful use. So like I said, um, 
cultural appropriation has become so widespread that people don't really know what it means anymore. But I want to stress the fact that not everything should be considered cultural appropriation. We don't want to uh, hinder innocuous uses. We don't want to prevent people from exchanging between cultures. We don't want these interactions to be stifled because there's suddenly um, a chilling effect because everyone is so afraid of cultural, culturally appropriating that they will refrain from using any form of influence or inspiration from other cultures. So that's not what uh, we're aiming for, right? We want to promote the principle of freedom of artistic expression and so it's important not to go all one way or the other. Uh, it cannot be unnuanced, and we don't want to hinder any use of traditional cultural expression. And I have an example on the screen of um, a design by a French designer, Paul Poiret. He was uh, designing at the end of the uh, 19th and beginning of the 20th century, and he introduced uh, harem pants in European fashion. Um, these were uh, imported, so to speak, from the oriental cultures of Turkey or the Middle East. And yeah, that was, let's say, one step closer to uh, women wearing the pants that, uh, that we all know today. Uh, Paul Poiret is also known uh, or accredited for uh, being the one who freed women of the corset. Uh, so we can see that uh, there are some possible benefits to cultural influences. So we don't want to stifle any form of uh, cultural exchanges altogether. So like I say, cultures are fluid anyways. They're not static, they are dynamic, they are evolving. And so to restrain any free flows of exchanges would be to negate their very essence. But be that as it may, cultural appropriation exists. And I was interested to see where it comes from and what might explain it being so prevalent today. And I've ant identified uh, two clusters of uh, reasons. The first has to do with the nature of the fashion industry itself. Um, I've mentioned already that there's a culture of copying that's inherent in the industry. And I'll go in a bit more detail about why that is. There is also a love of controversy in fashion. Uh, it's also s it's often seen as one of the artistic areas where um, boundaries are really pushed. And since the 1990s, but actually since the dawn of civilization, there's always been a taste for uh, ethnic or folkloric or things that are reminiscent of a, a time past and that can really reconnect uh, the wearers of clothing with their identity and with their history. And fashion nowadays is really, uh, we can see that there's a very um, uh, strong appetite, I should say, uh, for all things that are marked as ethnic or indigenous or folkloric in one way or the other. And why that is, is I think because there's such high demand in fashion to appear novel and fresh that sometimes referencing your own culture is not enough. You have to go further and further away to find something that's different and to present to your consumers as something new and original. And that's what makes designers go into uh, even more diverse cultures than they used to before. And the other set of uh, reasons that I think might explain cultural appropriation is because there's legal uncertainty around the issues of using uh, traditional cultural expressions. Um, traditional cultures have a jarring relationship with copyright, but with the whole intellectual property system in general. And so that makes it very difficult to decide whether a use is permitted or not. And there's also a gray zone between what would be considered permissible inspiration and what would be harmful misappropriation or misuse. And I'll go into detail for each of these reasons. So the first one is what I call the copycat uh, culture in, the, in fashion. And one thing that we notice when we look at the use of intellectual property within the fashion industry is that it's very, very low. There's very low levels of protection. And that has been studied by two scholars in the United States called um, Ross Tiala and Sprigman, and they've come across what they call the piracy paradox, 
where the more fashion is copied, the better it is for designers to be creative. And I'll explain that, but they say that IP rules, so intellectual property rules, providing for free appropriation of fashion designs accelerate the diffusion of designs and styles. We call this process induced obsolescence. Designers in turn respond to this obsolescence with new designs. In short, piracy paradoxically benefits designers by inducing more rapid turnover and additional sales. So in other words, a designer uh, who creates something new or original will quickly be copied, whether it is by peers or by other actors in the fashion industry. Typically, it will go from high-end designer to fast fashion. And this cycle uh, will actually perpetuate itself because as soon as the fashion trend has trickled down to fast fashion, it's no longer appealing. Um, there's a, a sociologist called George Simmel who said, as fashion spreads, it gradually goes to its doom. So as soon as a fashion has spread as far as it could go, it's already out. So designers are forced to be even more creative and constantly come up with new and original designs in order to fill what has been left by this, by this doom. So that might explain why there's a very low level of copyright or design protection in fashion. And in that sense, cultural appropriation is just another manifestation of a tendency of designers to just help themselves with inspiration from their peers, from outside. They're just used to copying, and that's the way the wheel goes. Actually, that might change. Um, in uh, 2017, there was a very important case in the United States that reached the Supreme Court. Uh, it's the case of Star Athletica versus uh, Varsity Brands. And that was the case of uh, cheerleaders' outfits. And uh, one company had copied the specific designs on the outfits, and that reached, like I said, the Supreme Court level. Um, and the Supreme Court held that there is indeed copyright protection for the aesthetic um, elements of useful articles. So there's this distinction in copyright of what is useful, uh, what might protect you from the, the cold or the sun, and what is simply aesthetic or ornamental. And the court agreed that copyright can be used to protect only the ornamental elements as long as they're not useful. So that paved the way to allow uh, copyright protection of clothing design. And it'd be interesting to see what will be the legacy of that decision because uh, it does start a new trend uh, in an industry that's been rather shy in uh, having copyright protection over, um, over its uh, creative products. Um, the second aspect, I think, within the fashion industry is that it loves controversy. Uh, we expect that fashion will be uh, surprising or that it will be awe-inspiring or even shocking. Um, I was reading uh, some magazines and newspapers in the aftermath of several cultural appropriation cases and the journalists were explaining, or maybe not justifying, but saying, this is what fashion should be doing. They, one of the journalists said, to shock is part of fashion, otherwise it would not be fashion. And another one said, taboo breaking has always given fashion its tempo. Only those who attract attention, offend, and sometimes even shock can arouse new interest. So although it might be desirable that fashion um, shakes things up, uh, that it tries to push the boundaries to advance on, on questions that society is grappling with on many different levels, such as in social issues or environmental issues, but that doesn't give designers a license to cause harm, right? So there's, again, a balance that needs to be drawn, uh, that needs to be struck between um, this, this expectation that we have of fashion of being a trailblazer, but also respecting the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities uh, when their cultures are being expressed in fashion. And the last aspect of the fashion industry is the fact that there's a 
an overwhelming appetite for all things um, indigenous. And if you look at the, fas the, pace, sorry, the pages of fashion magazines, they are awash uh, with clothing from, uh, and accessories from, uh, with a folkloric flair. And I've just brought two examples for you, but I'm sure you could open any one and find uh, pictures such as these, which is uh, a model who is, um, I don't know if you can all see, but she's dressed in what would appear as traditional Native American uh, or Native Canadian uh, clothing. And there's, there's many like this. There's also, often you will find a sheet with, with a title like ethno, uh, ethnic fashion or ethno chic. And you will see all sorts of uh, patterns being mixed and often with images of um, faraway lands. So this is really what you see uh, in the world of fashion. And I think that this is definitely contributing to to cultural appropriation uh, occurring more and more because designers sense this tendency, this, uh, this trend, and they want to be part of it. Now, I mentioned that there were uh, reasons inherent to fashion, but there's also those that are due to the fact that traditional cultural expressions have um, a very complicated relationship with copyright. And although copyright would seem to be the perfect legal instrument to protect traditional cultural expressions, when we look at how copyright law is uh, designed and drafted, we see that there are impossible standards to meet uh, for any traditional cultural expression to be able to be protected by copyright. So if we look at the first um, item on the list, it's the criteria of originality. And this is, really fundamental in copyright law. Uh, an element uh, cannot be protected under copyright if it is not original. Um, the case law has determined that the threshold for originality is extremely low. However, for something that's been passed down through the generation, as I've mentioned before, it can no longer be considered original under copyright law. However, adaptations and those that would contain enough original elements may be protected by copyright. But traditional cultural expressions as such, because they feel to make, fail to meet that criterion, would not be protected under copyright. And the same goes with the, uh, the principle of ownership. Um, intellectual property, of course, there is a form of property law, just like land property and copyright also. But the concept of ownership, as it is expressed in copyright law, is often contradictory or does not really represent the way that indigenous people see or regard or have a relationship with their own culture. They are not owning it. They are often uh, guardians. They are simply guarding it for future generations, or they are the stewards that are meant to take care of it, but never have a property right over that culture. And so that con con sorry, that creates a conflict uh, between the, the, the property concept at the root of copyright law and the way that traditional cultures are usually held uh, and passed down through generations. The third uh, principle is the one of fixation. So in uh, many copyright law jurisdictions, uh, a copyright work cannot be protected unless it, it is fixed in a um, material or tangible form. So if I uh, were not being uh, recorded at the moment, um, this might not be considered as a fixed form. Therefore, my presentation to you would not be considered as a, a copyright work. Um, so sometimes you have to have a material representation of a work uh, in order to be uh, protected by copyright. That's usually in copyright law jurisdiction, as I said. But for traditions that are transmitted orally, often without any written trace, that's also a huge obstacle to receiving copyright protection. And I'm not even talking about uh, face painting that will go off that are not considered to be fixed or, or sand carvings, you know, that might be blown away by the wind. Uh, anything that's transmitted orally uh, might not qualify. There's also the principle of authorship. Um, in copyright law, we recognize usually one individual author for each work. 
uh, in the context of traditional cultural expressions, they are often created or transmitted in a collective context, such as there's no one identifiable author, or if there was one, it's uh, long gone. Um, and that means that it's difficult to reconcile the notion of authorship, uh, which would give rise to copyright for something that's developed collectively. And even further down the line, if the, the the, cult, the community that holds the traditional cultural expression uh, were to be considered the author, what, what date of creation would we take to consider, or the date of, uh, um, of passing of the author, if uh, that's how we calculate the, the duration, the, the period of protection, how do you calculate that when it's something that's been created by an entire community as opposed to just one individual author? So that's already covering my um, second to last point, whereas copyright is um, a balanced system such that it grants protection to works, but this protection is limited, and it is limited in time. Economic rights expire, and that's usually, uh, they're usually valid during the life of the author plus 50 uh, which is the minimum international standards, or 70 years, or even longer than that. But many indigenous peoples and local communities prefer to have their cultures protected in perpetuity. So having a, a time where protection is no longer available is not appropriate to the way that they see their culture being constantly uh, transmitted to further generations. And lastly, there's also the... Um, the concept of exceptions and limitations. I've mentioned that copyright is a balanced system. So there, is, there are exclusive rights that are granted to an author, but that's on the understanding that the public also has interests and has to have the right to access or to use the work under certain uh, circumstances. And these materialize in the forms of exceptions and limitations. You may be able to uh, use a part of a work for a quotation, for criticism, for parody. Uh, libraries may be able to make copies, even though that would be an infringement. They can make copies if it's for preservation purposes, for example. So within copyright law, there are many exceptions and limitations that render um, the rights a bit less, com um, not complete, but um, um, yeah, that, that makes the right not uh, fully exclusive in the way that the public sometimes has the right to use the works without asking for permission or without even having to pay. And one of the fundamenta fundamental limitations in copyright law is the concept of the public domain that I've already mentioned. So the public domain um, is a very complicated area of research, but to put it simply, if we look at the copyright system as a closed system, we can see that there's uh, the works that are protected by copyright, and then there's the rest. So material that is not protected by copyright, and that forms the public domain. It can be in the public domain because it has never been protected in the first place. For example, the works of Shakespeare uh, were never protected by copyright because copyright law didn't exist at the time of Shakespeare, so that's in the public domain. Um, they can be in the public domain because they are not considered as works. So if something is not original, like I said already, it cannot be protected by copyright. Therefore, it will be in the public domain. Uh, but what we as usually think uh, of as the public domain is all the works whose uh, protection has expired. So things that were protected at some point, but ha we say that have fallen into the public domain. So the term of protection has expired, uh, therefore, it's no longer the exclusive property of the author, and it goes into a giant pool of cultural material that can be used freely by anyone. And that, unfortunately, is what may give rise to cultural appropriation, because uh, designers might think, well, it's in the public domain, it's not protected by copyright, therefore it's in the public domain, so I can freely use it. And that was what the statement on the Wikipedia page that I showed at the beginning of the presentation truly represented. Uh, it's not protected by copyright, therefore anyone can freely use it. Well, that might be true if we were to consider copyright as a closed system, 
but we don't just operate under copyright in the world, right? There's all sorts of other rules and laws that apply. And one of them, and one set of rules, is customary law and the customary law of indigenous peoples who have, who incorporate the rules on how to access their culture, how to use them, and they sometimes have very, very drastic punishment for anyone who might use their culture in the wrong way, so within the customary or traditional context. So what happens is that we have a copyright system that says, sure, it's in the public domain, you can use it, but then there's other rules, like customary rules, that say, well, no, we don't agree. And there's this conflict between these two systems that give rise to cultural appropriation, where designers are not aware of customary laws or protocols or rules or practices and are not bound by it, really. Because customary law is often of limited application, it's within a it's very small jurisdiction. It might apply only within the territory of a community and is usually not applicable to outsiders. So this is really where I think there's room for improvement because we need to have these two systems talk to each other and influence each other because they cannot operate uh, separately because this gives rise to cult cultural appropriation. And just as an example on the public domain, Sorry, I'd like to give an example of the TP. And um, it's uh, uh, assistant professor Minha T. Pham from the Pratt Institute in New York, and she's really interested in issues of race and gender and fashion, who wrote about um, the TP as it was involved in the case where fashion designers had registered copyright in the United States over a TP design. And she said, there was a tacit agreement that the general TP design itself was public property. The publicness of the TP, the idea that it existed in the public domain belonging to no one, and so was freely available to be manipulated, refined, and transformed into fashion for the use and profit of the Western author was a belief that literally went without saying. So it's really a belief that's entrenched in many designers, that they just say, it's in the public domain, I can use it, and I can appropriate it. Then there's the issue of the gray zone. Um, a designer might become aware that there is cultural appropriation going on, and now I think no designer has any excuse to say they've never heard of the issue. It's, it, it, it's widespread enough to say that no one can escape and claim ignorance. But a designer might be wishing to use a cultural element in his design, but it stands at a, a sign like this and knows that if it goes one way, it will be appreciative, it'll be an homage, it will be a, a form of appreciation of culture, and if it goes the other way, it will be accused of cultural appropriation, of imitation, of copying, of plagiarism, all sorts of terms that we've heard in the media. So the designer might be aware of that, but it doesn't know which way is which. There's this a um, gray zone where we really don't know which way to go in order to do the right thing. And uh, a lot of designers have claimed that they were unaware or that they were ignorant. And although I think that this is no longer acceptable as a, not a let alone an excuse, but as a justification, it's still very difficult to tell which way is the right way and which way is the wrong way and where do we draw the line. So in the paper that I wrote for CG, um, I was interested to see also what are the consequences uh, on uh, indigenous people and local communities. Um, and I found that it can cause extreme social, cultural, political, and economic harm. Because many of us might think of clothing as utilitarian, right? It's warm, um, it's, uh, I want to protect my skin from the sun, uh, it's really cold, I want to put on as many layers as possible, so it's really just a, a utilitarian function. But for many indigenous people, uh, clothing is far more than that. Um, it's a symbol of identity, and uh, it's not just ornamental or functional, but it's imbued with meaning that's intricately woven into the identities uh, of their bearers. 
and copying designs without consent and disregard for the significance, it can erode a community's identity and cause profound harm. And I've uh, seen an exhibition in Montreal at the McCord Museum, and I encourage all of you to go and see it if ever you're in Montreal. It's entitled Wearing Our Identity, the First People's Collection. And I could read that first people's identity is intrinsically linked to their dress. Beyond its main purpose of protection, it tells observers the age and status of the individual, gives immediate information about the nation he or she belongs to, pays homage to the person's remarkable achievements, and highlights the intimate relationship that exists between people and nature. And what happens in cultural appropriation is that that meaning is lost. And therefore, the identity that's so closely identified with a piece of clothing is also eroded, almost erased. And I'll give you a few examples. Remember I mentioned the Nike sneaker at the beginning? So they had applied a, a, a design that looked a lot like a mola on sneakers that were designed to be worn by men. However, the Kuna people said, this design is exclusively for women in our community. So this meaning was completely lost when Nike appropriated it. And Nike did the reverse in, um, uh, in Polynesia where uh, it designed uh, workout leggings for women that were printed with traditional male uh, tattoo patterns uh, from the Samoan uh, culture. So you can see that there is cultural insensi insensitivity that really causes harm and really strips what could be a simple design, just aesthetic design, but from its real meaning. Um, you may have heard also of the uh, Navajo versus uh, Urban Outfitters case. That was a case in the United States. It was more about trademarks, so I won't go into too many details. Uh, but the council for um, Urban Outfitters, who was being sued by the Navajo Nation for using the Navajo name and Navajo patterns on all sorts of, of objects and pieces of clothing, said, so that's Urban Outfitters uh, in a court filing said, Navajo is today a generic descriptor for a particular category of design and style. So not only is it not the name of a tribe, it's just a generic style. Um, there was another case in Australia where um, Aboriginal prints were used by um, American designer duo Rodarte. Uh, and the designs that they had reproduced on dresses and all, all sorts of clothing uh, represented, and I quote, a clan's song lines, story, life, and very essence with re responsibilities and reciprocal obligations to land and kin. And their use out of context was completely insensitive to Aboriginal art and spirituality and land and how they are inextricably linked. So you can see how it can actually cause profound harm. And I'm not even mentioning all of them, but I can give you more examples if you're interested afterwards. So not only is it cultural or social harm, it can also cause economic harm. Because in many countries and for many indigenous peoples, handicraft and especially the production of dress and traditional dress is a source of income. And sometimes it's the only one for a woman and her family. So if uh, it's being copied and, and sold elsewhere, then you really take out a source of income for these traditional communities. And we're talking sometimes hundreds of millions uh, of dollars. This is a picture of a Maasai. And the Maasai is a um, an indigenous community in Tanzania and Kenya and Africa, and they have this typical checkered uh, blue and red uh, blanket that's been copied by, name it, uh, Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, uh, Diane von Furstenberg, and they've all used this design, but without sharing any of the benefits back with the Maasai. And that really represents hundreds of millions of dollars of sales. But uh, not only that, um, um, consumers might be interested in, in, uh, in having the Calvin Klein name associated with a blanket as opposed to uh, something original, authentic. So it really displaces the sales. Um, it also causes uh, the prices to be dragged, uh, the race to the bottom, because the community has to compete with more and more uh, offerings of its own original designs. There was a case. Uh, um, 
uh, involving Canada and UK. So it's a UK-based designer called uh, KTZ who copied uh, an Inuit parka. Uh, it was easily recognizable. It had uh, um, um, prints of uh, hands onto the front and, and, and several very recognizable designs. And the great-granddaughter of the Inuit man who had owned this parka uh, contacted KTZ and, you, and said, well, you're using my grandfather's design. How could you do that? And KTZ apologized, said, listen, no harm intended. We'll, uh, we'll just uh, remove it from sale. But the great-granddaughter didn't see one dime of the sweater that was sold for almost $1,000 a piece. Um, and I already mentioned the Isabel Marin, remember? 300 pesos in Santa Maria de la 4,500 pesos on netaporte.com. There are huge margins. So like I said, it's not always easy for designers to tell which way is which. So in the course of my research, I tried to see um, how could designers, instead of appropriating culture, how could they use cultures in an appropriate way in fashion? And I've come up with uh, four main principles. And the first one is understanding and respect. So designers should be encouraged to research. Uh, to get to, in touch with the community, to understand where the design comes from, uh, what does it mean to the community that's been transmitting it uh, from generation to generation for centuries, and try to see, well, if this is so important to them, how can I use it in a way that will be respectful? The second principle is that of transformation and not replication, so don't replicate negative stereotypes of the pictures that I've shown you before, you know, with feathers in your hair and some things that may be considered very offensive and stereotypical, but transform them. Add your own creativity to it. Uh, put your own uh, personal note on things and um, it might be an enrichment for both cultures because there will be something new to discover for both the taker and um, the, the, the community that served as inspiration. The third principle is that of acknowledgement and attribution. So I mentioned Isabel Marin, who just took a blouse and put her label on it. There was no form of attribution. She didn't name the community. She didn't acknowledge that her inspiration had come from there. But it would be so simple to just say, you know, give credit where credit is due without even having to contact the community if that's so difficult. You know, just at least acknowledge that that's where it comes from. But of course, it would be much better if designers could truly engage uh, with the traditional uh, or indigenous communities and request authorization of, or what is the standard that's currently emerging is the free, prior, and informed consent that communities could give in order to allow outsiders to use elements of their cultures um, in fashion. And there are many good examples of designers that have tried to build a deeper relationships uh, with communities. Um, unfortunately, none of them are without flaws. So there's no best solution, best practice that we could say, yeah, perfect, everyone should do it like that. Um, but the case of Osklin in Brazil uh, is often cited as being a true success story where a Brazilian designer went to a tribe in the Amazon and ask for permission beforehand, and even uh, paid the community, I think it was in the order of $50,000, which represented an important sum for that community, and was actually according to the terms that they had demanded, before the designer used the, the tattoo motifs and also design patterns that the, the community had been transmitted uh, for generations. Uh, closer to us in Canada, um, you may know of Canada Goose. They make um, outwear. And they just launched a project in January called Project Atigi. Uh, and Atigi is an Inuktitut word that means caribou par parka with fur inside, where um, they 
asked or they invited uh, 14 seamstresses from different Inuit communities across Canada to create their own Canada Goose parka, so using Canada Goose material and all the modern technology that's associated with it, but embroidering it with uh, their own culture, their own identity and their own messages and the way that they see how their culture should be represented. So these parkas are for sale, if you're interested. Um, I'm not making any form of publicity, but I just want to say that the benefits um, would go to the National Inuit representat Representational Organization called Inuit Tapirit Kanatami. Um, there's also another example I could mention, but I think I'll skip that because um, time is running out. I, I'm happy to give more details afterwards. Um, so looking at now uh, more concrete solutions. What could be done to address cultural appropriation? Well, aiming as high uh, as we could, I'd say, well, we should create new laws. We've seen that copyright uh, is not adapted. Uh, it's not adequate to provide protection to traditional cultural expressions. However, um, the principles that are at the basis of the copyright system find a direct echo in the claims of indigenous peoples and local communities in the sense that they want better respect. They want to be acknowledged. Well, copyright law already includes what the concept of moral rights. And these are the rights of attribution. So paternity also it's called the right of paternity where you have to attribute the author whenever you use a work and the right of integrity when no one can uh, use or modify or distort a work in a way that would cause prejudice to the honor or the reputation of uh, the author. And I think that if we look at the principles of moral rights and extract them from copyright and adapt them in a way that would be um, uh, that would provide adequate protection to traditional cultural expressions, we might actually achieve um, a, a great step forward. Um, this is a picture of the WIPO uh, conference room where the discussions take place uh, uh, within the intergovernmental committee that, I think, that I've mentioned. And the committee is discussing draft articles for the protection of cultural expressions. So, um, I won't go through the detail. It might be a bit scary that it's Article 5, Alternative 3, Option 1, Article 5.1, A, Little Roman V. <laughs> but moral rights are in there somewhere, and that's not the only place where they are. Um, but we can see that there's already a draft provision uh, concerning prevent preventing or prohibiting the use or modification which distorts or mutilates a traditional cultural expression or that otherwise diminishes its cultural significance to the beneficiary. And also the other prong of moral rights, attribution, so encourage users to attribute said protected traditional cultural expression to the beneficiaries. And I mentioned Panama quite a few times and I'll mention it again. Uh, Panama is one of the few countries in the world that already has a sui generis law. Sui generis means of its own kind, tailor-made. So it's a law that's spe specially designed to protect traditional cultural expression. And it's inspired by copyright. And I wouldn't be surprised if that uh, didn't play in the negotiation with Nike when it was so quick to cancel the launch of its sneaker that I'm wondering if maybe um, the fact that Panama has a law uh, had a, a role to play, but I'm not familiar with the details of the case. Um, and I just want to quote what one of the representatives of the CUNA said regarding that case, saying, we're not against our MOLA being commercialized. What we oppose is it being done without consulting us first. So it's a matter of uh, uh, designers reaching out again to the community and saying, well, is it okay if I use it? Then I think that designers could be proactive themselves. They could reach out again and ask for permission and get into agreements, and I can give further examples later on. But also they could develop their own standards. So there are already internal norms that regulate copying without, uh, within the industry, sorry. So designers among themselves have a sort of code of honor where um, 
they will refrain from copying each other based, based on uh, shame or uh, fact that they want to, their reputation to stay intact within the community or their, or their industry and their, um, in front of their peers. But that does not extend to where they take their sources. So there's actually no standard currently that says, well, this is fine, this is respectful of indigenous people's right, or this isn't. And I think that the, the industry could be more proactive and develop such a standard. They already do so for ethical fashion where they respect workers' rights or uh, environmentally friendly uh, fashion. So that already uh, exists in other areas. I also think that consumers should be mo made more aware. Um, the millennials generation, they're very uh, aware of social and environmental issues and they often express uh, their beliefs through fashion and through the, their consumption patterns. So if they are made aware of such issues, they will express it. They will refrain from buying uh, things that they consider are uh, culturally appropriating. And, and if demand can die out, well, uh, offer a supply will certainly follow. And lastly, I think one of the um, most important area where something can be done is to support the indigenous designers themselves. Um, for example, Kim Picard, she's a designer based in Montreal from the Passamit First Nations community. She says, I want our culture to be alive in modern clothing. Our native culture is not only in the past or in museums, but it can be anywhere. And I think that indigenous designers can be their culture's most powerful voice. They know what it means to be authentic. They know the customary rules that are around uh, their own culture. So they really can present an authentic vision of their culture. And it's a matter of supporting that with your fin financially or through all, all sorts of skills. Um, and I want to mention uh, one initiative that has been co-founded by designer Sage Paul. Sorry, it might be a bit difficult to read. Um, she's a member of the English River First Nation. Uh, she's a designer who's based in Toronto, and she founded the Indigenous Fashion Week in Toronto. And she says, we're really lucky uh, that Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto receives funding from the Ontario Arts Council because it recognizes fashion as an art form that carries on important Indigenous traditions and cultural practices. But on the largest scale of fashion, we need to support our designers by creating the resources for them in the same way that we do for musicians. And it's a very interesting article on in the state of uh, Canadian fashion, which more and more recognizes the place of indigenous fashion within the national industry. So in conclusion, that brings, you, uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. I'd say that there are many things that can be done to curb uh, cultural appropriation. Um, creating new laws is one of them. It's probably the most uh, difficult path, uh, but I think we shouldn't shy away from trying to achieve that. Uh, but in the meantime, working with the current uh, legal framework, I think there are many initiatives that can be done and that many of us here in this room uh, can already do. So I thank you very much for your attention and I welcome any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Now, it seems to me about 15 years ago, Colors of Benetton had the models with the Indian headdress, and there was immediate European and North American outrage, and it was immediately cancelled. I have the feeling, but I'd, I'd like to hear from you, does that outrage still exist, or are we just kind of complacent now? Um, to my knowledge, it still exists. Um, the Isabelle Mahan case was a huge outcry uh, on Twitter and on various social media. That was 2015. Uh, the Kuna Nike sneaker case, uh, if you want to look it up, you will see that it still raises a lot of, uh, of comments from all corners of the world. Uh, I think now that uh, we are more aware of these cases of cultural appropriation because social media is such a good channel to bring attention to these issues, but it falls short of providing any form of standing for uh, the cultural, the, sorry, the indigenous communities to actually bring any complaints in front of the courts. So it's great to bring attention and, and, and awareness among the public through social media, but that 
doesn't give them any legal foundation to actually make the harm stop. Yes. Um, thank you for that very insightful presentation. One of the elements of your definition of cultural appropriation is the existence of a minority culture, right? So I was wondering if um, you can go a bit deeper to explain who can claim to be a part of a certain culture. Mm -hmm. And I ask that question in the light of the seeming controversy that arose in the wake of the movie Black Panther. Mm -hmm when um, African diasporans began to dress in um, several African attires to go watch the movie in the cinemas. And in most cases, the apparels and the clothing distorted the original intention behind those uh, designs, mm -hmm. particularly in an African context. Um, the African diaspora would say, we are just trying to connect with the motherland. We are part of this culture as much as you are. And that would be the argument of the diasporan, African diasporan designers. But the originalists, the Africans who understand the spiritual, sometimes the cultural connotations of some of these designs would object and say, you cannot wear that to see a movie because we wear these to perform X, Y, Z rituals. Mm -hmm. So, so who, who gets to claim uh, being a part of a particular culture, and what's the standard in your mm -hmm. view? Thank you. Well, thank you for this excellent question. Unfortunately, there is no straight answer, and it's still something that's being discussed. And the very pertinent case that you mentioned with the, the kente cloth that's been used in the movie Black Panther, but also you mentioned that a lot of uh, Africans, a uh, member of the African diaspora, uh, felt a connection with uh, their uh, ancestors back on the continent. I think, uh, yeah, these are very, very difficult questions to answer. And as, as long as there's no international consensus emerging about um, what is cultural appropriation, it will be very difficult to answer such questions. But I think it really exemplifies uh, the many different issues that are uh, currently uh, in, in discussion. And you mentioned something about minorities. It doesn't need to be a minority necessarily, but I think what's fundamental is that there has, be, has to be an unbalanced um, balance of power between the taker and the taken. Um, it often we won't be talking about cultural appropriation when it's uh, two cultures of, um, it's, it's, it's a bit, uh, yeah, tricky to explain, but if there's no um, uh, history of exploitation or domination, it might more, be more difficult to justify a claim of cultural appropriation, at least in the way that I understand the concept. Um, but uh, I do believe that this imbalance of power uh, is essential for something to qualify as cultural appropriation. I wonder if you could comment a little more broadly um, in, a, in a slightly broader context. As a Jewish person, I think that the Hebrew Bible has been culturally appropriated by Christians. For example, when there is, um, in Isaiah, predictions of a Messiah coming, the Christians interpret that to mean their Messiah, Jesus Christ, but that's not the case. What do you think about those kinds of appropriations that aren't even about money, but about long-standing, deep-rooted cultures? Mm -hmm. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't thought about that issue, and I focus my research on uh, designs and the use of designs in uh, the fashion industry. So that raises very interesting questions, but not that I have addressed yet, so I would be hard-pressed to give you uh, any thoughts on that at this moment. Um, but I do think that it's interesting, and it shows that the debate around cultural appropriation is not limited to fashion. Uh, that's certainly not what my presentation was uh, meant to be uh, sending as a message. It, it appears also in, the, in literature, uh, in music. There's famous cases uh, like the Deep Forest case, if you're interested, or Enigma, Return to Innocence. 
uh, in the music industry. Uh, for those of you with young children, maybe you've uh, heard of the Disney movie Moana, uh, story of a young Polynesian girl that was heavily drawn from Polynesian cultures. So cultural appropriation is definitely a phenomenon that spans many areas of uh, our cultures or even religion. Um, but I've limited my research to this particular issue, so unfortunately I have no further thoughts on your question. So in the presentation you talked about an example from the 1800s where a designer introduced harem pants. Mm -hmm. Why was that okay? I didn't quite follow that. Mm -hmm. I just took it as an example to show that this designer uh, introduced clothing that were considered to be liberating for women at the time, uh, where women were uh, expected to wear skirts or dresses and tight corsets. Uh, this designer brought a different style of clothing to Europe where women uh, felt uh, freed from the constraints of uh, wearing like I said, dresses or skirts, and I thought that was a positive contribution uh, to bringing more freedom to the way that women could dress. Um, I'm not commenting on the fact whether that was cultural appropriation or not. Uh, that's not why I brought the example, but just to show that sometimes um, exchanges uh, within cultures or across cultures can bring about positive cultural or social change, and I thought that was a good example of that. Um, if any of you have others to share, I'd love to hear from you as well. I just have two questions. One, I was surprised in your four principles that you didn't include compensation, and I'm wondering why you left compensation out. Uh, and the other question is just about the comparison that you might make as an intellectual property specialist between the fashion industry and the pharmaceutical industry, because it seems to me that maybe the law has gone a little bit further in the pharmaceutical industry, and I'm wondering if they're just inherently different sectors or if there's something that has happened in the pharmaceutical industry that can be imported into the fashion industry uh, to get us a little bit further along the road that you're proposing. Thank you for your two questions. Uh, on the first one, the issue of compensation, it's true that it wasn't on the slide, but it could be included in the fourth principle where I talk about engagement and asking for permission and entering into collaboration, which could involve a, uh, a benefit sharing mechanism or a one-off payment mechanism. And I did give the example of Osklen that did that. Uh, the reason I don't put it uh, up front in the four principles is that I think it really takes it one step beyond and um, it might be more difficult to achieve, where I, I think that the four principles that I've put on the screen uh, should be achievable. Uh, compensation really raises a whole different set of issues, and I do think that it's necessary and desirable. Uh, however, I think that it might be more difficult to achieve in the long term, and therefore uh, I try to keep it as a separate issue, and I want to focus more on respect and acknowledgement and maintaining the integrity so that um, uh, the honor and the reputation of the indigenous peoples is preserved. Uh, on your second point, uh, if there are any parallels to be drawn, um, there are, absolutely, and the discussions uh, in the World Intellectual Property Organization, although they address these two themes separately, uh, there's a lot of over overlap on the issues, uh, starting with the fact that uh, traditional cultural expressions uh, is a concept that only exists in terms of intellectual property uh, regimes. It's not a concept that might exist within indigenous people and the way that they perceive their own culture. Um, they will see traditional cultural expressions mixed in with traditional knowledge, which intellectual property treats separately. Now what you've mentioned about the pharmaceutical industry is mostly about traditional knowledge and traditional, uh, sorry, and genetic resources. And traditional knowledge is more something that within the uh, IP discourse we will associate with patent law. So this kind of artificial div division between traditional knowledge on one side and traditional cultural expression on the other follows a division that exists within the intellectual property system where we treat uh, ideas and innovations through the patent system and then creativity uh, and expression uh, through the copyright system. And because I focus so much on copyright, 
um, I haven't addressed all the patent aspect, but definitely I think there's overlap, uh, especially when it comes to questions of collaboration, prior informed consent, uh, benefit sharing. These are issues that are central to the discussions on traditional knowledge uh, within the patent industry. Hi, big messy topic. Um, I, I'm the curator of the Fashion History Museum, so we have a lot of examples in our collection that are big messy topics. Mm -hmm. um, getting to the Mexican blouse, it started this whole thing off uh, in your talk. How do you feel about, I could argue, that the Mexican blouse that you are talking about is the result of colonialization. It's uh, European fashions with uh, Asian embroidery mm -hmm. that have been combined to create a Mexican style of dress that has been appropriated by the Mexican culture mm -hmm. as their traditional dress. Mm -hmm. Dot, dot, dot. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very good point, and you mentioned this example, but there's many others of historical borrowings. Um, there's one other example that I could have mentioned. Uh, it's concerning the wax uh, fabric from Africa. So a lot of us will associate wax fabric with Western Africa, uh, but was actually a, a technique that was imported from Indonesia, and the, and the wax batik making in Indonesia brought over to Africa uh, by Dutch merchants. And, I think history is rife with uh, such examples. Um, I think one way to, to accept this is that um, cultures are dynamic, uh, cultures evolve, and we're not looking at cultural traditions in a frozen form. We're not saying uh, this is a culture, uh, this is how it is in a fashion museum, therefore this is how uh, a culture should represent itself. No, we accept that they're evolving and that they're um, there have been some mixes over time, and, and, and we have to look at the way that cultures uh, express themselves today, and we agree that they will probably not be like this tomorrow because it is within their nature uh, to evolve and, and be dynamic. Um, as long, I think what's important is that we have to understand that as long as a culture, uh, or a, in that case a motif or a type of blouse, is associated with a certain community, and that they feel a link to that, and that that link is very strong, I think we can say that they can uh, claim uh, that they have some uh, form of right or interest into preserving that, into um, further expressing that and in, in controlling the way that that is represented by others. Um, yeah, we have to make sure that, yeah, so, go ahead. Look, I, I, I sort of a relevant follow-up to that, too. Um, I don't know if you need the microphone. How do you, do I need oh. it also? I can you talk louder? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, what about, uh, for example, you're also saying that the, the onus is on the person to know where they're getting this from. Uh, academics often don't agree where something is from. If it's from Panama, from Mexico, and there's a joke, uh, a lot of uh, 18th century textile specialists will say that if you can't decide whether it's Spanish or Italian, it's probably Portuguese. Uh, <laughs> and it's, just, it's a joke, but there's some truth to that because it doesn't quite fit uh, I, either culture. And, and you're going to, a, a floral embroidered blouse could be Hungarian, it could be Filipino, it could be, I think, say, Mexican. Uh, it, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a unique object. Mm -hmm. and trying to pin it down, it's not yeah. where it comes from, it's problematic. Mm -hmm. Well, it is problematic, but it's not uh, insurmountable. I think that many cultures share uh, uh, traditional cultural elements, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a fact of life. Like I said, the, Ma the Maasai, they straddle both Kenya and Tanzania. So uh, were Kenya to adopt a law to protect the cultural heritage of the Maasai, would it apply to the Maasai in Tanzania and vice versa? Or if there are two different communities on one territory and they both claim uh, to have uh, ownerships, uh, in, in quotation mark, of, of, of a cultural element, well, this will be a dispute that will have to be settled. But I don't think it's insurmountable to saying that we have to stop others from causing harm by appropriating. Now, as to who can claim that, uh, I agree that on the practical level, uh, we might come across difficult situation, but that doesn't prevent the fact that um, we, sh we shouldn't ca uh, caution or we shouldn't, sorry, what's the word? Um, yeah, we shouldn't uh, endorse, there you go. We shouldn't endorse uh, designers from taking something just on 
on the, with the excuse that it belongs to many and cannot be associated to one particular one and, and ends up causing harm to one of the, of the uh, holders of traditional cultural expressions. It shouldn't be a way out to say, well, I can't identif identify one, therefore I'm just going to use it. If there's harm, um, it shouldn't be tolerated. What about a copy of a copy? Like, what if you go to the juice and you buy a loaf of coral flour and it's a copy of something that was a copy of something that was a copy of original? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I agree that sometimes it can appear as very subjective, and that's why we need more clarity into developing objective criteria to say, okay, this is clearly uh, a taking that's been done without permission, without acknowledgement, and it's causing severe harm. Uh, therefore, our society does not accept this, and we think we need to do something about it. Um, but yeah, you raise many practical issues that were, will certainly arise, but uh, yeah, as every cultural or social question I think it's constantly being challenged and I'm glad that you're it's here fun. yeah <laughs> to remind us all of that yeah <laughs> and got all the different uh, seamstress together to to make their own designs and mm -hmm. coats uh, they needless to say if there was 12 of them there was 12 s similar but somewhat different designs as well even though they're all from the same community? Uh, so there were, uh, if my recollection is correct, there were 14 seamstresses from nine different communities from four different Inuit regions. So I think that the idea was to get a, as broad a representation as possible. And uh, there's actually a, a nice video online if you're interested. You can go to the Canada Goose website and see uh, how this project uh, devol evolved and developed and how uh, these seamstresses really uh, use the techniques and the patterns that are uh, from their own community and tell their own story. But what I'm trying to say is, is you could grab one of them and say this is, is, is a, uh, a representative of the community, but then you take one of the other 14 and hold it up. It's close, but it's not the same, and then the same around. So as you're saying, everything is, there's nothing static anymore. Everything mm -hmm. is changing. Yeah. With them. Oh yeah, and I'm, I don't mean to say that there's one particular type of embroidery, like the mixe embroidery. There's not one particular type, um, but I'm not the expert to say. Maybe you can explain better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so it's true that we don't want to go to a database and look at uh, different Inuit embroidery designs and see, oh, is this one uh, that should be protected or not? That's not the, the, the idea behind it. It's just, I think it's a subjective uh, uh, criterion uh, where there, uh, a community could be a, uh, associated or linked with a particular design, and if they feel that they have a connection with a certain design and they can, uh, they can express that, then I think that it's this, what gives a legitimate uh, um, yeah, standing to be able to, to base any claims. So. Yeah. so thank you very much for a, a great uh, presentation, and thank you for drawing our attention to the, the Inuit-designed uh, jackets. They're actually quite lovely. I Googled them uh, while you were speaking. Um, no, they seriously are very, very lovely. Um, I wanted to ask you a question pertaining to the identification of a particular group and the linkage to harm. So I'm, I'm sure you're aware of Tom's uh, and the, the gentleman's trip to Argentina, finding what is a widely held shoe, uh, what I would say maybe more widely held traditional knowledge. So outside of kind of the inner closer tier or more specifically held, but something that is kind of widely used. He then adopted that, uh, had some made in Argentina, returned back to the US, had them manufactured in mass, and is there some sort of benefit to the fact that he gives away a pair of shoes, mm -hmm. that there's some altruistic aspect that doesn't bring about some sort of negative social pushback? Uh, because it does seem to edge towards a cultural appropriation type mm -hmm. uh, lens, but mm -hmm. there also seems to be quite wide adoption and a uh, positive sentiment to the, the give back mm -hmm. uh, that he, he does. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to see your thoughts. Yeah, I, I didn't see the Tom Shoe as an example of cultural appropriation, so I hadn't looked at it under that aspect. Um, and it goes back to uh, what uh, you said earlier about um, the compensation aspect. I don't think uh, compensation is, should necessarily always be there. 
Uh, I don't think that it's a necessary condition. Um, I think that first step before we uh, go there would be to do it with respect and with acknowledgement. And that's why I think a focus should first be placed on moral type uh, protection before we go into economic type protection. But the word intellectual property is certainly developing an economic rights type of protection that would, uh, that would ensure that there's retribution, that there's a form of benefit sharing. So in the case of Tom's I'm not familiar with the facts themselves. Um, like it doesn't have to be a direct financial compensation. It could also be non-monetary, right? It could be like in the case of Oakland in Brazil, I think they help build a school. They build also a project to uh, prevent deforestation. Uh, they help set up a shop so that they can sell their own um, products. So. Yeah, in the case of Tom's, there's a complete dissociation from uh, the benefits of the philanthropy and then the the communities that were at the origin of the design. But what I mean is compensation can be far beyond just monetary terms, and it can express itself in many ways. But thank you for raising that example. Thank you, Bridget. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, I just had a quick question, and this is more about government accountability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've we've discussed so many examples in which you raised how fashion designers, and it was more individualistic private entities, maybe corporations to a certain extent, but the Vancouver Olympics was mm -hmm. a classic example in which the government of Canada allowed cultural appropriation under its nose with the Canadian team going around with mm -hmm. culturally appropriated sweaters. Is there any other laws? Is there any other uh, discussions going on with respect to making governments accountable for such breaches? I mean, this, this was something that just struck my mind and uh, just wanted to know if there was something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think uh, currently um, in the discussions at WIPO, uh, when we talk about delimiting a scope of protection, uh, there's no distinction as to who might be uh, infringing. So it could be an individual, it could be uh, a moral person, and it could be a government. I don't think that there is uh, a distinction as to uh, who the infringer might be. Uh, I can understand that it raises a lot of issues within Canada. I have to say that I haven't uh, delved deep into that issue, but um, it does bring me to uh, consider another point where uh, within the discussions at WIPO, um, the beneficiaries of protection, so those who might be able to benefit protection, uh, might not necessarily be uh, the ones who own the rights. So we could have a legal system that protects indigenous people and local communities, but the state would actually own the rights on behalf of these people and manage the rights on their behalf. So this is an option that's currently being discussed at WIPO in countries where, um, for various reasons, uh, it is believed that uh, a central cultural authority would be the one uh, giving out permission and re collecting uh, the monies received for uh, in compensation for use, and then would be uh, reinvesting that either giving it back to the communities or investing it in, in cultural promotion um, uh, initiatives. So I think your point also brings us to thinking what is the role of the, the government or the state in relation to uh, the rights that would be given to indigenous people. So that's something to also closely follow up on. Do we have time for more questions or do we have to, okay. Yeah, so thank you very much for your question. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brigitte, for this enlightening presentation. We all enjoyed uh, your slides, your talk, your examples. I want to thank you, uh, all of you, uh, for uh, attending this afternoon's session and for your uh, active participation and your questions. And looking forward to see you in future events. I have one note that uh, our coming event on June 12th, it will be the final of this year's cinema series, will feature the 2014 TIFF Master Selection, uh, Trick or Treaty, the film examines the history of Treaty 9, uh, the uh, 1905 agreement between the government of Canada and indigenous people concerning the lands around James Bay. 
looking forward to see you on June 12th. And thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much.